Hey. <laughs> um, tonight at 8.30, we're going to be doing Bible classes via Zoom. You can still sign up for them on our website. We've got two different ones. One's on the book of Revelation, and the other one is on Habits of Grace. So just check out our website, sign up, and come together again for Bible study or Bible classes. Isn't that great? The other thing I wanted to let you know about is our women's ministry is still um, very active, even though we haven't been able to meet. And I'm excited to say that this Thursday at 930 in our lobby, our ladies will be coming together for a time of prayer. So if you would like to join us, just come by the lobby at 930. Um, it'll be about an hour. And it's just a, it'll be really great to be able to be together with one another, to pray, to pray for our community, our church, um, and for our nation as well. So it's great to see everyone. And let's get started with worship. All right, good morning. Why don't you stand as we prepare for worship this morning? We started a new series. Pastor Matt started a new series last week that is called None Greater. Um, and so this week I've been just processing through this idea of greatness. Um, and I tend to use the word great a lot, probably too much. Like I think a steak cooked to medium at best is great. Um, I think uh, that golf, personally, I think golf is great. I think teaching is great. My point is I use great to describe a lot of different things, probably too many, and our culture does too, right? We talk about things being the GOAT, G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time. But this summer we are saying, we're, we're learning to say that there is none greater than the God of the Bible, none this past week, I had the chance to go to the beach for a few days, and um, I love going to the beach. My wife was a little bit concerned this summer that we weren't going to actually be able to go with everything going on, and I told her, I said, well, if you're that concerned, I'll just find some sand. We'll put it in the backyard. I'll turn on some, like, a sound machine that's got ocean, you know, waves playing in the background. It'll be pretty much the same. She's not one who really likes getting in the water anyway. I thought, it's pretty much the same thing, right? And she was not amused. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny, but she didn't think it was very funny. Uh, but anyways, I say all that because I want you to think, like, why do you love to go to the beach? Why do you love going to the mountains? Why do you love going to some place where it's just a place where it's beautiful? Um, pick your place, wherever that would be. And I was just thinking about this this week as I was standing and looking out at the ocean, thinking, I love it because it reminds me that I'm small. Like, as I stare out at the Atlantic Ocean, looking as far as my eye can see, which is not that far, I'm reminded that I'm small, and simultaneously being reminded I'm small and reminded that God is great. And there's just something peaceful about remembering that I'm small and that God is, uh, God is big and he is great. And early, early on this week, I was, it was just not my favorite week of the year. Just had some different things going on. And stand, but then I was standing in front of the ocean thinking, like, it put into perspective things, like put in perspective from my own heart, just like how, where does my problems and issues rank in the big scheme of how big God is. But it also reminded me how big God is that he can handle the different things that are, that are going on. So as I was thinking through this idea of greatness this week, I was thinking through some scripture and I came across Psalm 145. And I would strongly encourage you to go read the entire thing. It's, I don't remember how many verses it is, but I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to read the first three verses this morning. Psalm 145. Verses 1-3 says this, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and, er and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I love that third verse. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, his greatness is unsearchable. And just processing through that he's great he's greatly to be praised his greatness is unsearchable that's a lot of greatness all packed into one verse so our songs this morning are surrounded by this idea of just God being great and that we want to glorify and worship him in that let's pray as we uh, as we open up our service here in singing father we thank you for this morning that what a two weeks in a row just stellar beautiful weather just your good graces to us this morning that we can uh, just worship you for that. We're thankful that you are great. 
that your greatness is unsearchable and that you are greatly to be praised. And so, God, our desire this morning is to lift you high and to uh, proclaim your greatness both here and then around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When my heart is heavy for all my days 
Yeah. 
above all names You're the name above all names You are worthy of all praise And my heart will sing out praise He's our God Sing that again, name above all names sings my soul then sings my soul my savior god to thee and how great thou art and how great thou art then sings my soul Father, we thank you for, uh, again, this beautiful day. We're thankful that you are great and that we can sing of your greatness. And may, our, may your greatness uh, give us the heart and the desire to want to worship you because you're great regardless of what life has thrown at us this last uh, week or longer. God, we're just thankful for your, uh, for your greatness. And now as we think about uh, our, our time of offering, God, we're thankful uh, just for your faithfulness in the giving of your people here at Mount Calvary Church. And we're thankful for the different ministries that continue to have more thankful for the opportunity to do uh, to do start Bible studies uh, uh, tonight. And we're thankful for the women's ministry having the opportunity to be able to meet in person this week. We're thankful for how you're using the gifts and uh, uh, the tithes and offerings from our people to further your kingdom both here and around the world. And this morning, we think of um, our missionary of the week, Krista Das, who's in India. And we're thankful that uh, he reported this week that he's doing and his family are doing well, that they're safe from uh, COVID-19. We're thankful for that. But we're also thankful for that they've recently had an opportunity uh, to provide some groceries to some needy families. And in doing so, they had the chance to share uh, the gospel with them. We're thankful for the work that he's doing in planting churches uh, in a challenging area of the world. And so we're thankful for his ministry. We pray that you would uh, bless him and give him encouragement today. Um, I know we, we also heard in his report this week that they were meeting, I, I believe, outside again, or meeting together at least, I think, outside for church again uh, starting today. And I think that would have already happened this morning for them. But we're thankful for the opportunity that they've had to gather. Pray that you would bless them in their in their efforts as they now try to regather their churches. Um, and it's amazing to think that we have brothers and sisters that are doing the same kinds of things halfway across the world. And we just ask that you would uh, pour out your blessing on Christodos and his ministry. And God, as now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would uh, just give Pastor Matt the, uh, the words that you've already laid on his heart that he'd be able to proclaim to us uh, this morning, uh, and that we would have the hearts to be able to hear what he has to say. God, we pray that you would just bless the reading of your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take a seat.
just a second here. Which mic? This one? Hello, good morning. How about this beautiful day? It's not going to be this nice for the rest of the summer. So I hope you really like it out here. I'm enjoying God's beautiful creation. What a cool, beautiful morning. I um, want to welcome you to Mount Calvary Church. For those that are here, um, we're glad that you're here. And we're thankful that we can worship together face to face to those who are at home who aren't ready to be here. Um, I'm very grateful that you can worship with us as well. To those who are on vacation, we're jealous, but we're glad that you can worship with us wherever you are. To those that we don't even know, maybe somebody shared it on Facebook um, and you're not a part of our church. We're so thankful for technology that we can still worship together whether you're here or you're not here. Uh, we started a new series for the summer that we're calling None Greater. It's the cry of Jeremiah, and it was the kind of the theme verse that I chose for this series, and it's a, it's a proclamation of the prophet Jeremiah. It, it's my prayer that as we go through this series that we would be able to proclaim what Jeremiah proclaims. And he says this, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. There is none like you. And it is my prayer that we, myself included, would, would think about the depths and the complexities and the perfection of our great God, and it would cause us to praise God in this way. You are great. There is none like you. And so last week we, we started out this series, and the way that we started it out was with this word in the Greek called epinosis, this deeper, relational, more intimate knowledge and experience of our great God. And it is my prayer that this is the kind of knowledge that we would have. Not head knowledge, not a memorization of all of God's attributes, not even memorizing these verses, but a personal, relational knowledge of who God is. And this is so important for us as believers. It is critical. I said last week, this may be the most important series that I've taught because how we think of God and what we think of God determines how we walk with God. It determines how we work. And it determines how we love. It determines how we worship. And so it is vital for us to have a God-sized vision of who God actually is. And so we're drilling deep we're going beneath the surface with God's attributes because our prayer and our hope is that we would know God better. We'd wonder more. We'd worship more. That we'd be humble as we come before God. But the word that kind of stuck out to me this week as I was thinking about this series, it's the first song that we sang this morning. That we'd glorify God. That we would give God the glory for his greatness, for his unending nature. That we'd acknowledge him for who he is, is indescribable, full of majesty. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to glorify God in recognizing who he is. And so this morning we want to start with one of his attributes. And the question that, or the attribute deals with God's presence. And as I was thinking about God's presence, like where, the question that came to my mind that I feel like, I've been asked more about these last three or four months, um, is this question with regards to God's presence. Where is God? Where is he? In light of 400,000 being infected and passing away because of this virus. Where is God in light of the racism? Where is God in light of the the policemen being 
killed and the riots and the unrest, the disunity? Where is he in this political climate that we're living in? Where is he around us? What is he doing? Personally, this has been a question that we've, that, that our family has been asking. Where are you, God? My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer several months ago. She's gone through 18 radiation treatments. God, where are you? Like, where are you in this diagnosis? Where are you? Are you here? Are you aware of what's happening? And this is the question that's tied with God's presence. And as you think about the presence of God, it's a, it's a really fascinating concept. To me, it is. And if you go through Genesis and you work your way all the way to Revelation, the presence of God is a constant theme of the scriptures. Being in the presence of God. Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve were hiding from God, and they heard him in the garden. How did they respond? Genesis 3, 8 tells us, They hid themselves from the presence of God. All through the Old Testament, with the burning bush and the pillar of fire, with the tabernacle, with the Holy of Holies, it's all about being in the presence of God or the barriers that keep us from being in the presence of God. In the New Testament, Christ, we've talked about it in John 1, God with us. Jesus is the presence of God, and we are with him. The Holy Spirit, the indwelling of God in us as believers. And we could spend a lot of time going through the whole narrative of the scriptures to see that it is about the presence of God. And then you get to the end in Revelation 21. Listen to how it's written about the, God's presence. Chapter 21, 3 says this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with, him, with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. God, at the end, in the day that is coming, will be with his people completely, perfectly, and fully. And so we're in Genesis 3. starts with Adam and Eve hiding from the presence of God, the, the scriptures close with us dwelling perfectly with God. And so this is what we want to think about with God's presence. How can we know God's presence better? How does it help us answer the question about where is God? What can we learn from the scriptures? What can help us understand the presence of of God. And as I was going through my three points, um, I quickly realized that this is three different sermons, four, probably four sermons. And so we're going to enjoy this weather this morning. Here are the three points just to kind of give you a preview. First, God is high above and he is near. So that's one point. It's really two points, but I'm making it one. He's high above and he is near. Second point, he's here, he's everywhere. And the third point, we're alienated, we're united. It might help if you write these down. It's probably hard to get in your mind. But one more time, he's high above and he's near. He's here and he's everywhere. And third, we're alienated and we're united. Okay? Hopefully, as you're just kind of thinking about those words, you, you, you hear the tension in these points. The tension that these points almost sound like opposites. Almost sound like opposite spectrums of an understanding of something. God is high above He's far above, and he is right here near. He's here. He's everywhere. We're alienated, and we're united. There is tension with understanding the presence of God. It's like a rubber band. 
And what we're doing with each of these points is we're stretching out the rubber band and we're acknowledging that we're talking about both ends of the rubber band and that it's, it's complex and that we're not going to fully understand it, but we're okay with that. That we, we know that, that with knowledge, we can't understand God. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that we can't expect to fully understand God completely. And so we're, in looking at God's presence, we're acknowledging the tension, the complexity, and we're okay with that. There was an, an illustration that I thought, I thought was pretty funny. A young boy and his mother were having a serious discussion over lunch one day. Where is God, he asks innocently. He's in heaven, his mother replies. Does he live there? Yes. Well, where's Jesus? He's in your heart. But I thought Jesus and God were the same person. Well, they are. Well, how can he be in heaven and in my heart at the same time? Sweetheart, it's hard to explain. A short pause, and he says, where does the Holy Spirit live? Another short pause. I think it's time to take a nap, son. This is tricky, but it is so good for us to study and to think and to stretch our minds about God's presence. So let's pray, and then we'll get into our first point. Father, we are thankful that you haven't left us here. We're thankful that you've revealed yourself to us, even if it's in ways that we can't fully understand. Help us this morning to become more aware of your presence. More aware. Better aware. Help us this morning to be mind blown at the complexities of your omnipresence. God, because we want to be humble before you, we want to worship before you, and we want to be encouraged before you. So help us this morning, Holy Spirit. We need your help in understanding and in thinking. We need your encouragement. We need your conviction this morning. So God, we ask that you help us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. He's high above and he's near. Okay, the first point. It's the the standard question or the standard answer that somebody will give you if you ask them the question. Where is God? If you ask a child, where is God? What are the children going to do? Are even adults going to do? He's up there. Point up. He's upstairs. He's living in heaven. Well, what does God's word tell us about where God is? It is a consistent theme that God is indeed up there, that he is high above. Listen to the scriptures. Psalm 97.9, for you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Ecclesiastes 5.2, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and not on earth. He's not only in heaven, scriptures tell us he's above the heavens. Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Psalm 57, 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. God is up above. He is high above. He is higher than the heaven. But the question for us is what does that mean? What does it mean to say God is upstairs? Is it the picture of a lifeguard sitting on their stand watching the little swimmers below? What is the picture being described by saying God is above us? One theologian made this, John Frame is his name, and he made this faulty understanding of the fact that God is above. Here's what he says. God is so far above us, so very different from anything on earth, that we can say nothing, at least nothing positive about him. He transcends our language, so anything we say about him is utterly inadequate. 
Is that the point of God being far above and high above that we can't relate to him? He can't hear us, that he is so far away from us that we are being ignored. Well, no. No, that's not the case of what Scripture teaches us about God being high above in the heavens. Two things that I think can kind of help us as we think about God being up in heaven that hopefully help explain what that means. The first thing is that I think when Scriptures talk about God being in heaven, the, the writers are trying to make the point that God is not fully, completely here. He is not only here that he can't be contained by our world. I love Solomon's prayer as he's dedicating the temple. Okay, so it's, it's an incredible prayer, and you would think that Solomon would be more proud than he's ever been. He has just finished building the temple, which is supposed to represent the presence of God among his people. And so as, as Solomon is dedicating this temple, praying about this temple, you don't see pride. In fact, you see the opposite of that. He says in 1 Kings 8, 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. He is saying, it's great that we built this temple. The heavens are great as well. Nothing can contain the presence of our God. So when we say he's high above, it's not that he's at some point above us. It's a picture for us to think that God is outside of us and he is uncontained, that the heavens don't even contain the full presence of God. But it's not just about where God is. I think the language of God being far above and high above also is teaching us about the, the reign of God or the enthronement of God. Listen to some of the language in the Psalms. Psalm 29, 10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Psalm 113, 5 and 6, who is like the Lord our God who sits enthroned on high? Do you hear? They're saying he's high above us, but he's not just wandering around. He is up high above us because he is seated on his throne. So I think the point of this language of God being high above is that he's not contained by anything we can see. But it's also this point that when we say God is high above, he is high above and he is sitting enthroned as the king. That he is not here he is completely in control of everything, watching out above. And so that's the one side of this first point, that God is far above. He's high above, but at the same time, God is near. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? So Jeremiah is making the point that, yes, God, you are far away far away, high above, but at the same time, he says, aren't, isn't he also a God at hand? God is far above, and at the same time, he is near. He's close. This is the language of Christmas, Emmanuel, that Christ is God with us. He's here with us that the Holy Spirit indwells us and the ministry of the Spirit gives us this closeness, presence of who God is. And so both of these statements are true. It is the theological words that we're talking about is God's transcendence and God's eminence. He's high above, but he's here and he's in our presence. And so if we just go back to my original question, where is God in death and pain and cancer? The answer, according to this first point, is that he's, where is he? He's high above and he sits on his throne in control of everything that happens. But he's also here in our midst, comforting us, sustaining us, revealing himself to us. God's transcendence and his eminence teaches us a lot about the question of where. Second point, he's here. And he's everywhere. 
Okay, this is the omnipresence of God. So transcendence and imminence. Now we're thinking about the, the, the omnipresence of God. And as I was just thinking about this, I mean, it's to speak of God being up there and to be down here, we've got to be really clear about what we mean by that. Because God is always everywhere. God is always everywhere. He is 100% present in 100% and of every single place, every nook and every cranny. God is always fully, completely present. He is omnipresent. Psalm 139, the famous passage that talks about the presence of God being wherever we are, wherever we go. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Verse 8, if I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. I mean, it's interesting that the psalmist is making this point so strongly about God's presence. Verse 8, if I ascend to the heaven, you are there. That means you can fly into space and God is there. You can look into space and God is whatever you can see. There's a kid's devotional that we read with our with our three kiddos at dinner, and it's, it's Louis Giglio's um, devotions on God and science. And here's what he was describing about our ability to see into space. He says, did you know that on a clear night away from the city lights and using only your eyes, you can see all the way to the Andromeda galaxy, which is located an astonishing two and a half million light years from Earth? Kiddos, you listen to this? That you can see this far on earth, on a clear night. Listen to what it says. On a really good night, you can see all the way to a star called Deneb, one of the brightest stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Scientists aren't sure exactly how far away Deneb is, but they think it's nine quadrillion miles away. That's nine with a bunch of zeros. A lot of zeros. Here's, here's what we are learning about God's presence. That we can see, believe it or not, nine quadrillion, I can hardly say it, miles away. And that wherever that star is, listen, God's presence is fully there. And it is nine quadrillion more miles away. God's presence is fully there too. And he is everywhere in between fully and completely, every single square inch of our galaxy. He is there. Verse 9 says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Kids, are you listening? How many of you are going to the beach this summer? Beach? Beach? It's okay. We're excited. We're going to the beach. I love the beach. Okay, the the psalmist says that I can go to the uttermost parts of the sea and God's presence is there. Well, I was reading about the vastness of our ocean. Okay, our vast, vast ocean that even though the, the earth is covered by 70% of water of the ocean, did you know that we've only explored of that 70%, 5%. That's how big the ocean is. Now, why is that? How is that the case? It's not that it's so far away, but the reason that we've only touched or began to explore our ocean is because the ocean is so tremendously deep. There's one section in the Pacific Ocean called the Challenger Deep. And as I was reading about how deep this section of the Pacific Ocean is, Okay, it is so deep that you can take the world's tallest mountain, that you could set it in the ocean all the way to the bottom, and that the ocean will still cover by a mile the, the height of that mountain. Kids, 
It is so deep at this section of the ocean that you could see a school bus. Do we have? Oh, that's that's not helpful. School buses. Well, they're not here. Where are they? Okay. Well, next time you see a school bus, you can think about this. You could take a school bus, a regular sized school bus, and if you were to stack them up on top of each other long ways, that you would stack 1,024 school buses. 1,024 school buses until you get to the top of that part of the ocean. Next time you see a school bus, I want you to count out loud for your parents to hear to 1,024. You're welcome. That's how deep the ocean is. And guess what? God's presence is at the bottom on every grain of sand, a place that we've never even been to, on every shell. He is there fully. His presence cannot be stopped. So just thinking about the omnipresence of God, just a few implications. I'm going to just read these because I think it's hopefully helpful as we stretch our thinking about God's presence. Since this is the case, so I'm referring to everything I've said, since God is omnipresent, God doesn't move like we move. I go, I'm going from here to there. I'm going home after church. Moving implies going from one place to another. God doesn't move. He is in all places already completely and fully. Since this is the case, he's not somewhere, but he's everywhere. We are at one place at a time. I like to sit on my sofa. I like to sit on my porch, but I don't do both of those at the same time. I guess we can move the sofa out on the porch, but that's not going to work. God is infinitely present. He is what we call spaceless. He has no body. He is everywhere, all the time. Since this is the case, we don't need to invite him here on this soccer field this morning. Because he was here before we got here, he'll be after we leave. He was here before you were born, he was here. Before this space even existed, he was here. He will be in this space forever and always, fully and completely. Since this is the case, that God's presence means he's everywhere, fully and completely. God is not more present at one place, in one country, in one county, in one city, than he is another. He is equally present all the time, fully, in all places. He's not an American, right? He's not more here than anywhere else. And so just thinking about the metaphors that people try to use in describing the presence of God, as I was thinking about these metaphors, they're helpful. You're going to do one as a family. If you got the the coloring sheet from Melissa, nothing wrong with a good metaphor. But all metaphors fall way short of capturing the presence of God. One writer said that God's presence is like the air that we breathe. Said it's odorless and tasteless and invisible. One writer said that God's presence is like radio waves. They're invisible, but they're everywhere, that we don't even realize that they're there in the room. Microwave and shortwave and AM, FM and TV and cell phone and CB and police and on and on, the amount of radio waves that are all around us. And so, yeah, they, those things, air and wa- radio waves, may be invisible like God's presence, but they are far from omnipresent. Air isn't everywhere. It's not on the moon. It's not in a vacuum chamber. Air, the composition of air can change with pollution, with elevation. So it is helpful to try to understand God's full presence everywhere but we've got to be okay with there's not a really good metaphor to help us get there. So let's get a little bit more personal with this. I mean, I think it's helpful to to think about God's presence, but personally, God is with you always. Now, I know this is well overstated. I mean, God is with you. God is with you. We hear this. It's, It's But as I was just thinking through this section of my sermon, I was 
my mind was blown by this truth. God is with you fully right now. He, in his amazing, splendid, and majestic presence, is here right now, and he will not leave. And when you go home, God is with you fully, completely, perfectly. He will be with you the moment right before you choose to sin. He is right there in your presence. He is there with you in your presence when you sleep, when you cry, when you eat, when you celebrate. God's presence, his full presence is with you. What a thought that is. What a thought. And we close with this. We're alienated and we're united. We're alienated and we're united. Okay, there's a sense, and this is what I've been talking about. There's a sense where everyone who has is, who is ever lived, who's ever breathed, has been in the presence of God. The omnipresence of God. Okay, you, you're tracking with me? Everyone. Everyone who lives, it doesn't matter what you think about God, his presence is there. That's his omnipresence. But there is also a sense when we're, a, there's a sense in scriptures that though God is here all around us, there's a sense that there's this alienation between us and the presence of God. Okay? And here's the truth. Here's, here's what I'm saying. Our sin keeps us from being able to personally interact with the presence of God. Okay? So, and, and Scripture describes all of these types of presence, if I can say it like that. But there is a very clear sense in Scripture that our sin keeps us from personally being able to interact with God. Back in the garden with Adam and Eve. Okay, what did they do? They covered themselves. They felt this alienation with God because of their sin. They were sent out of the garden, separated from being able to walk with God in the garden. Genesis 4, a really interesting passage where Cain, when Cain had killed Abel, the description about what the sin that Cain committed with, in regards with the presence of God. Genesis 4, 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. It's not saying that God's omnipresence stopped. Okay, God was with Cain's omnipresently wherever he went. But it is saying the personal interaction that Cain had with God was no more. His sin caused him to be away from God's presence. Our sin keeps us from being able to relationally experience the presence of God. But God's omnipresence in one, in one hand keeps us in the presence of God. It's, it's similar to what happens when a baby is born. And I, I remember experiencing this with my daughter, Caroline. Okay, when my daughter was born, Caroline, our firstborn, I remember being able to hold her. Okay, a very intimate presence. We're, we're together. She is resting upon me. She was just born. The, the, the relational presence between us, the experience that I had being able to hold her was a very sweet moment. And then the nurse came in and took my baby. No, they, my wife used to do this. So she, she was that kind of nurse, but she the, nice, the nurse took my baby to the nursery for some shots. Okay, this is normal. It happens. Okay, I wasn't happy about it, but what did I do? As the father, I went and followed my daughter to the nursery. And you see all the new dads sitting at the glass, like looking for their child who's getting shots. Okay, I was with my daughter even in the nursery. Okay, but it was a very different type of presence. It was a very different type of presence. The presence with my daughter while she was getting her shots was separated by plexiglass. I was with her, but I couldn't hold her. And, and this is, 
a picture of what our experience with God's presence is like. Our sin is like the plexiglass that keeps us from enjoying the warmth of relationship of God. So we are alienated because of our sin. We are far from God in one way because of our sin. But thanks be to God that he provided a way to take away the barrier. That that's where we all are, but because of Christ. Hebrews 10 talks about this. That we have the confidence to enter into the holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. That because that he sent Christ to, to be crucified on our behalf, that this alienation, this glass, plexiglass um, wall has been destroyed. And that we can draw near, Hebrews tells us, that we can draw near to God with confidence because of how he has taken care of our sin. And so for us as we close, I, I'm asking you, as you reflect on God's presence in your life, what is it like? Like as you think about it right now in your experience, in your day-to-day -day life, what is the your, your experience, what is, your, um, what is it like for you to be in the presence of God? Which one is it? And think of the metaphor. Is your experience of God feel more like the father who is watching his son or daughter through the, through the plexiglass, watching them get their shots? Or is it more like the father who is holding his daughter close what is your experience of the presence of God? And, and I'm telling you, God longs for it to be this one, holding you closely, feeling, experiencing his presence and comfort and love. That's why he sent his son. And so my prayer for all of us, as we have stretched our minds, hopefully, about where God is, that at the end of the day, we would do some reflecting on our experience of his presence. If you are living in sin, it affects your experience of that presence. Run to the cross. Humble yourself at the cross. Confess, repent, and just like that, just so easily, you go from being far from him through the plexiglass to the closeness of a father and a son. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for all of this, that you are far above, you are high above, you are transcendent, sitting upon your throne in complete control of everything that happens. And at the same time, you are near, you are close. Your son, Jesus, is you with us, that we can experience that. God, we're thankful that you are here right now fully, completely, perfectly. But you're more than just here. You are everywhere. From the farthest nooks and crannies of the universe to the deepest depths of the ocean, you are there. And God, we're thankful that you did something so that we would not be alienated from you forever that we could experience the love of the Father of you because of the cross. And I pray for all of us here as we reflect and think about our understanding of your presence with us on a day-to-day -day basis. God, I, I pray that if there's somebody here who feels like they're living deep in sin and they feel like you are a million miles away, God, I pray that they turn their eyes to the cross, the bridge, that they would recognize that though you may feel far, you are right here waiting for us to confess and to humble ourselves to turn from our sin. And just like that, in the quickness of that moment, you go from being felt a million miles away to being here with us as our loving, caring Father. So God, if there's someone here who is deceived by their sin, if they are deep into sin, whatever that may be. God, I pray 
that you would humble them, that you would help them turn their eyes from their sin to the cross. We love you. We worship you. We acknowledge you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and we'll close by singing, uh, Oh, Praise the Name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound, his body bound, and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. And to praise the name of the Lord our God, who oh, praise His name for Third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, and no oh, trample death. Where is your sting? The angel rose for Christ the King, and oh, shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. And to praise the name of the Lord our God, oh, praise His name.
so we face another week. May we live moment by moment in a posture of wonder towards our deep and multifaceted and perfect God. God has revealed himself in the scriptures. He's transcendent above all creation, yet he is intimately present here now. He is timelessly eternal, yet he works in this moment now. He is just and holy and perfectly righteous, but yet now he gives grace and mercy. He is unchanging, yet he is changing all things now. He is, as Augustine prayed, never new, never old, always active, always in repose. He is the architect of the vast starry galaxies, the engineer of the tiny microscopic scale cells of our body. He is the one who sent his son to the cross. He is the one and only, everlasting, unsearchable. Our God is perfect and there is none greater. May this knowledge fill our mind and our heart in whatever we face this week. Have a great day.